welcome to uh, the Big Time Strength podcast. That's also going to be our Big Time Strength uh, and football clinic that we're going to have on March 28th. And and I'm actually this one is a really fun one for me because I'm I'm interviewing our co-host for the Big Time Strength podcast. So you guys know Gage. Um, if you're listening to this on audio, uh, there's there's no doubt that um, you would you want to check out YouTube for this stuff too because. Um, his presentation, it's, it's good with audio, but it's going to be better with the video because you're going to be able to see some of the documents and stuff that he shares um, and just walks us through some of the information that he's using within his program. But this is Coach Gage Rozier. He is the Director of Athletic Performance at William Jewell College in Liberty, Missouri. It's kind of a suburb of Kansas City. Um, and and I'm, I'm telling you, um, when, when I get to interview Gage, I always learn stuff. When I get to talk to Gage, I always learn stuff. So I'm excited about this. And, and one of the things that he won't tell you, but I probably will, is this might be our second time going through because I messed up the first time. So he's gracious enough to, to go round two with me here. And, and I am, uh, I'm excited to learn. He's going to be going through um, what it's like to make the big time where you're at. And for him, that's at William Jewell. So uh, Gage, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on with us. Uh, and you can take it away from here. All right, coach. Uh, thank you. Number one, uh, all the work you do on the podcast, but this clinic you had put together, uh, I think it was a, an awesome idea. And obviously with just the circumstances surrounding everything right now, it, it sucks that uh, we weren't able to really um, execute it the way you wanted to, but we're finding a way to do it online here, which I think is great. Um, and just FYI too, I am in my basement as most people are and my son, two-year-old son is running around. So if you hear some yelling or screaming at some point, um, everything's okay. It's just my son <laughs> doing, doing what he does. So uh, like you said, kind of what I want to talk about today is um, just the podcast itself, just for a little bit. I want to give some context um, for maybe those who are um, new to it, who don't know. We'll talk about maybe why we decided to do the podcast and then the majority of my talk will be um, discussing things I've implemented from guests from the podcast to William Jewell College. Uh, so basically just stuff I've stole um, and implemented at Jewell from uh, people who are much smarter than me. So first off, um, I get my slide. There it goes. Uh, um, introduction. Um, like uh, Preston already covered most of it. I'm the director of athletic performance at Jewel. Uh, fourth year there, we have over 22 sports, 400 plus athletes. I'm very fortunate right now. I have a full time um, athletic performance coach at GA, and, and we're lucky enough to have from one to three or four interns every semester too. So, from a staffing standpoint, I'm doing okay. You know, I, I'm very appreciative of our administration. They're supporting us in the weight room. Um, and, and they've equipped us with what we need to really deliver a, a big time experience for athletes. We have uh, weight rooms a decent size, 3,000 square feet, uh, 10 racks. Before <clears throat> uh, Jewel, I was a G8 Northwest Missouri State with prep. Um, there was a great experience learning under Joe Quinlan um, and the rest of the staff there. Uh, summer 2014, I spent a short stint at uh, University of Missouri learning from them. So. Personal wise, I'm from Mount City, Missouri. I like to make this joke. Um, I think Mount City, Missouri is a strength conditioning coach hotbed. There is about 900 people in that town, and there's about five or six uh, full time strength coaches who have came out of there. So it's kind of fun. Um, little uh, hotbed in middle of Missouri or middle of the United States of strength coaches in, in Mount City, Missouri. So uh, married to my wife, Ashley. Um, so my son there in the picture, if you're looking online, he's awesome. And we have a, a baby girl here on May 4th. Um, kind of another joke I have is May 4th is Star Wars Day, which every time I tell people what they, the babies do, they say, oh, Star Wars Day. Yeah, I get it. Um, not really a funny joke, but I did put it in there. All right. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the origin of the podcast itself. So when I got um, interested in strength conditioning back in college, just consuming all this content, right? And I love podcasts. So um, on the YouTube, on the video, there's there's four of them there that I really liked. Obviously, Ron Kiefer's Barbell Shrug was big at the time. Industrial Strength Show. Uh, Mike Robertson has a really good podcast. Um, those are great. Learned so much from them and, and still do. Still do learn a lot from those, those episodes or podcasts. But what I found was when I got the head job at William Jewell College, 
I was 24 years old. Uh, these podcasts really didn't cover a lot of my issues, uh, a lot of administrative type stuff, and really dive into the challenges of being a small school strength coach that most of us are, either at a college or high school level. So obviously with that setting, there comes limited staffs, budget space, equipment. I mean, you're programming for, I program for up to eight to 12 teams, depending on the time of the year, my staff situation. Um, and then obviously you got your time and schedule constraints um, based off of class schedules and all this. You know, you don't necessarily have this huge weight room um, and just just one team to program for that maybe um, a lot of the big time coaches might at a D1 level. So we started, we decided to do um, this big time strength podcast as uh, maybe a way to fill a knowledge gap um, and provide a resource for the majority of our industry probably who is um, doesn't have all the bells and whistles maybe as some of those um, big time programs that are typically on big time podcasts, if that makes sense. We started the podcast in May, 2018. Uh, we had no idea how to do it, uh, but we figured it out. Uh, I, I want to shout out to Ron McKeefrey and Google and Preston uh, for helping us get that figured out. But that's kind of origin of it. The mission, we want to provide a resource to all strength conditioning uh, through conversations with small school strength coaches who maximize their resources to give a big time experience. Uh, secondarily, you know, give recognition to, you know, small coaches who are, we've talked to some amazing coaches and I, I know Preston would agree with that, both at the college and high school level that are just doing amazing things at schools that you've probably never heard of. Uh, so we want to give those coaches a platform uh, to just talk about what they do and we can learn from them uh, especially in, in when they're in similar situations as us. Uh, what the podcast is not, it's not a big money maker. We're not making you know, hardly any money off of it. We do have some sponsors um, that help us just kind of pay for the show. It does have a slight cost for it. Um, it's not a download chaser. We're, we're lucky and, uh, and we're proud. We do have over 30,000 downloads um, over about a year and a half now, which is awesome. Um, and it's not a diss on D1 strength coaches. I reached a small level D1 strength coach one time. Uh, if he wanted to be on the coat on the podcast, and he kind of um, remarked that he didn't think he was good enough to be on it since <laughs> he wasn't from a small school. So um, it's not a diss to D1 strength coaches, um, even though it might come off that way. That's not the case. So uh, guest list, real quick for those uh, who are seeing online, we have a, a couple more coming up. I think we got 84, 85 now, but this is the first 83. Had some, again, some just amazing coaches on that, which we'll get to here in a second. Um, but before I get into July, I was about, um, you know, what does it mean to make the big time where you're at? That's kind of the whole you know, tagline of the show is we're talking to coaches and talking to them about how do they make the situation they're in big time, okay? So I, I really like this quote from Teddy Roosevelt. It's, it's, you know, do the best you can with what you have where you are. So I kind of broke that down a little bit um, to how I think about it when I go about daily and, and what we try to do at, at William Jill College is do the best you can. So don't complain about your circumstances. You know, find a way to get stuff done. There, we all got stuff to complain about. I mean, we, we'd all rather have a bigger staff, a bigger weight room, um, more resources, a bigger budget. We get it. I mean, I, I get it. Administration gets it too. Uh, but what we try to do as a staff at Jewel is don't complain about those circumstances. You know, if they ask me what I need, I'm going to tell them, but I'm not banging down their door every day complaining about how bad I have it because I don't. Um, I'm gonna, instead, I'm going to find a way to get stuff done. So second with that is with what you have. So be able to utilize your resources, be creative. Um, and I think you'll see that as I move on here with my presentation, how we're doing some of those things and then where you are. So being present for your athletes, creating an experience for them is our top priority. You know, our, our vision for our department at William Jewell is to provide uh, a premier student athlete experience recognized for um, pushing athletes to the best version of themselves. So we are focused on, making William Jewell College athletic performance the best it possibly can for our athletes. Um, we're not looking just to use this as a stepping stone to move on to the D1 level or something else. That's not what it's about. So, um, you know, last thing with this is just, I, there's a quote um, from Monty Sparkman, 
episode number 33 of our podcast. I really liked it. His, his um, definition or description for what does it mean to make the big time where you're at? He said, it's not about the bells and whistles, but how you make the kids in your program feel special. And I think that was a, um, just a great thought from him. Uh, really, really hit home for me. So moving on from there, um, I want to discuss on, on how we're implementing stuff on the podcast to make William Jewell College big time. So number one um, is culture assessment. So Michael Silbernagel, he's at the University of Mary um, in North Dakota. He's one of our earlier episodes and he is, he is awesome. Uh, man, I got their social media at the bottom there. I um, hope he's okay with me putting it on there. Um, but the You Marry Strength Twitter and Instagram is a great resource. They do some fantastic stuff with their social media. I encourage everybody to, to um, check them out. But the main thing is with him is he talks about great athletes on your standard. So with culture, is, you, is your culture what you say your culture is? Um, and if it's important, we should track it, right? So we developed this system that um, Silvernagle had and he – uh, we, we adapted it quite a bit to fit what we're doing at Jewel a little bit. Um, it's a red, yellow, green system. When we grade our athletes um, according to standard, if you're red, you're below it. Yellow, you hit the standard, you're average. You did the minimum what we asked. And green is above the standard. So in full transparency, I've not done this um, with our athletes at Jewel for – the past year or so just for different reasons um, but I did want to go ahead and include it because when we did do it we were able to execute this very highly um, man it was great it was it was such an impactful thing for our athletes um, and we're going to try our best to get back to this um, so I'm, I, just full transparency we're we're working on a way to get back into doing this but it was it was very very effective when we did so the first step of this was communicating the standard right so I'm not going to read through all these, but before we really wanted to present this to our athletes, it was important for us as a staff to really nail down what we believe in and what we want out of our athletes, right? So um, we had core values at the time, but they weren't really that thorough or it was just kind of, you know, your typical ones that you maybe throw up on the wall. Um, so what we decided to do instead is, is really time and figure out what, uh, really made us tick what we wanted to see out of our athletes. So what we decided on is we got three core values. We have be disciplined, be responsible, be a teammate. And then underneath those, we have three key behaviors for each that we wanted to give our athletes practical. This is what we want to see out of you. So again, I'm not going to read through all these, but I'll just read maybe one behavior from each value is be disciplined, um, is do the work necessary for your goals every day regardless of how you feel. That's a big one for us. We talk about a lot. Uh, being responsible. We talk about doing what is asked of you with a positive attitude and your best effort. Uh, and being a teammate, we talked about and holding each other accountable to the standard. Um, there's, again, there's for each, each value there. But we wanted to be very clear on communicating that standard uh, to our athletes up front. So the next part of that is grading them on us, right? So communicating them to, to the athletes what we want. And I actually forgot to show, include on here the actual document that we gave to the athletes to show. We gave them red behavior examples, yellow examples, green examples. Um, and then we grade them on that. So after every, we'd sit down as a staff and my staff at the time, we'd go, athlete, you think it's red, yellow, or green based off what they saw that day. We would record it. Um, and this is our daily grading sheet. We would post this sheet on the door prior to the following workout. So every athlete, as they came in for that workout that day, they know how they were graded from the workout before. So if they're green, um, if, you're, again, if you're following on video, it'll definitely help. These are the green athletes. And I put a number correlating to why we green them. So we green them on uh, positive feedback, demonstrating uh, contagious energy, uh, whatever. And then also the reds over here, they have – uh, not filling out their team builder survey, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, showing up late. Those are the main reasons people were ready that day. So we also have little team goals, you know, first so daily, our goal was to be have over 50% of our guys in the green. We want hundred percent of our guys uh, filling out their team builder survey. Cause it was kind of a 
you got a filled out type process. We had three percent that day, not great, and we're going to be below ten for guys in the red, uh, which that day we're. Doing. So this is I should have put a better day up here uh, to be an example, but this is kind of a, um, a crappy day for our guys. But it is an example on how we uh, implement it on the daily, and also our football staff was very. Uh, on board with this to where if a guy was green every lift that week, they got a helmet sticker in the fall, which our guys uh, loved. They thought that was really cool. So with that, the next step of this is we track it. So um, it's just an example. Um, these are the guys over here, red you if you're red, green you if you're green. If it's white, it means you're yellow. You're just in the middle there. I didn't go ahead and fill in the yellows. And then we have those uh, team percentages at the bottom here. So we, we didn't just do it day by day, but we tracked it over the semester um, on how they did. So then the last thing we did was final grade. So we communicated to them on how they did throughout that semester. So every athlete came in, we talked to them. Um, and here's their total number of lifts, the times they were green, times they were red, times they were yellow. Here's our team averages, 43% green every day. 17% red, 40% yellow. Um, so every guy kind of knows where they stand uh, with us in our eyes. And then uh, we obviously give this to the football coaches as well, and they can see where um, they have the information as well uh, as they have individual talks with their guys. So, you know, this is not a perfect system, but what it did allow us to do is going back to the first question with Silbernagel is, is your culture what you say it is? And at this time, this has been fall 18, uh, we talked about being disciplined and being responsible. Well, are we yet? No, we're not. You see, we had over 28 lates or misses, unexcused lates or misses that that semester, which is a joke. Um, but it gives us feedback to share with the athletes on, on um, things we can do better um, and not just, you know, and to be who we say we are. So um, this was a really exciting or um, – effective process for us. Um, hope, hopefully you got some good ideas on maybe how you can implement that there if you're interested. Um, moving on, Preston, you have any questions on that or anything? Yeah, I, I just wanted to clarify um, that maybe the biggest time restraint is, is recording and making sure that you get to every athlete. Can you go into maybe why you didn't do it this past year and how you're going to get back to it? just so people know, and maybe the group sizes and that type of stuff. Yeah, so this has been fall 2018. So uh, spring 2018 and then early fall 19, I did not do it. Uh, and the main reasons was because our schedule changed. And in fall 2018, I had groups of like 20 to 25 and uh, about a four person staff at that or three person staff at that point. Um, and football hit in the schedule where it was just football in there. So it was kind of a perfect storm of we were, had three staff with a manageable number of athletes with just focused on that team where we could give a, a thorough and legitimate grade to the athletes. Um, compared to the spring in this previous fall, we had um, more like 30 to 40 athletes in those groups and maybe only two staff members on football at that time because also maybe softball was doing something out in the – our rec center there that another staff member had to go to. So it was just too much. We could have still done it, but we felt like, or I felt like I made a decision that we couldn't give a, um, a valued, good enough grade, legitimate enough grade is probably the better word to eat. It's to justify doing it. But I think as we hopefully regroup here, next time we come back, Again, as I said earlier, my, my staff has grown. So I'm thinking that we're going to be able to maybe implement this again, hopefully. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, that's good. I am, you know, as I go through this and listen to you, I just try to figure out what would be the best way for me to get it done. Because I think there is so much value because it opens up good conversations, right? Like probably not very many athletes when they get done with a workout think, man, I just really sucked at being a teammate today. You know, like they don't self-reflect like that. Um, so to have conversations and maybe open their eyes to that so that they can make those changes is such a big deal. And, you know, any way that we can find how to do that conversation, uh, and this is the tool, I think, to do that, 
is great. So yeah, good stuff with this. Yeah, and I think the last thing I, I would say with this is, you know, when we had those final grades and some of our athletes, we told them like, listen, we're tracking this and you're getting graded and we're tracking this, but I don't think they really believe this. So when they came in and I showed them like, hey, Billy or whatever your name is, you know, here's the reds, the greens, yellows, here's your percentages. This is how you compare to this. This is where we saw you. A lot of them were like shocked by it. Like, oh, you really were great. And I'm like, yeah, we told you we did, you know, 10 times. And some of them are shocked by just the number of reds they had or whatever. Uh, but a lot of them did know like exactly where they were. Like they weren't shocked by it at all. But it was kind of interesting to, to see that um, as we had those conversations. So, right. All right. So moving on to uh, athlete monitoring here. Brian Selleck, he's at Abla, um, another Kane City guy. He was an, another early one, number 12. He is um, – He's a brilliant, brilliant mind, and he, he just had a great conversation, excuse me, on how he monitors his athletes. Um, and prior to this conversation, we had tried to monitor the best that we could through workout cards and stuff. Well, about the same time, we switched to Team Builder. And, and Team Builder is a sponsor of our podcast, and they do a tremendous job. So we run, um, one, we made monitoring a priority, and we use Team Builder to collect that data. Um, and then we'll, we'll analyze data for some trends, which I'll show you in a second. But um, don't get too caught up on just Team Builder here. Obviously, I think they do a tremendous job. But you can find ways to get this done without Team Builder as well through Google Sheets or, or Google Forms, something like that. So um, with our athletes, we do a daily athlete wellness survey. So it's on the screen here if you're, if you're watching. How many hours of sleep, quality of sleep, soreness, energy, mood level. They, they answer those five questions uh, from a frequency every lift and on every game day um we do not do it every single day just on every lift on every game day just to keep the data that we can manage manageable um so this is an example of the report so this is back from 2018 but this is a football uh report as you can show it color codes it really nice to where you know you can run the whole report for the team and if you're just looking through it quickly you can just kind of get a gauge you got a lot of reds a lot of greens and if this is a game day you're a lot of greens on there uh this fortunately was not um but there's the five questions and also gives this total number over to the right that we'll look at i guess i should use the mouse here um and there's also a team average number at the you can't see on here but we also track that number which you'll see here on this next slide so analyzing the data so we wanted we didn't want to just collect it for you know collection sake but just to look for trends. Maybe we can um, get some good out of it. So what we, what you're looking at here is this is an Excel sheet that I take that data from. Um, and this is football fall. So like there's three days here. So this is Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, game day. So I'll, I'll total each five questions into a daily score, total those three daily scores into a weekly wellness score and just look for trends, right? Like it, it's not a perfect system. It is self-reported. It's not a catapult. We're looking at heart rates and stuff like that. But so stuff we can look at. So what we th thought was interesting is week four that year, we lost 27 to 20. Um, but this was the best game we played all year, in my opinion, pretty easily. Honestly, we lost to the number two team in the conference in the final, like, 10 seconds of the game. Um, on the road, too, they played – we played so well that day. Great energy, great effort, uh, really played good football. Uh, and our wellness score that day was weekly wellness score. It was almost a 66. Where you see the other ones were anywhere from the mid 61s to there's a 63 and a half there. Almost a 66 that week. You know, then we we won the next week. So you think, well, that doesn't matter. Well, we won 14 to 10 against a team who won zero games in the conference, and they missed like three field goals that day. So should have lost that game if they had a good, good kicker. Um, so again, looking for trends just gives us information. And I tell our guys this, like I, sh I share this information with them. And if you break that week four down, what we do different that week, well, we slept really well. We slept 7.6, 6.5, and 8.3 hours a night compared to usually in the fives or sixes uh, the rest of the day. So shockingly, big groundbreaking information here. Sleep's important. Uh, and we tell our guys that, but we also have data to back it up. So that's one way we're looking at my team perspective. 
but we're also tracking the athletes from an individual perspective as well. So if you remember back to this, we have this total, total um, number here. So we anybody that's below 18, that's not some like perfect number I researched, but it just seemed like 18 is probably not a great wellness day. Um, looking at all of our data and so we'll take each guy, put this into an Excel sheet as well. If well, that means they did not fill it out and there's consequence for that. If it's white, that means their wellness score is above 18. If it's red, it's below 18. We'll flag them. So again, looking for trends. Um, you know, if you're red, just a couple of days like this guy here, you know, we'll keep an eye on it, but it's not, you know, it's, they're college kids. They're not going to be fully recovered every day. But we'll look for trends. So this guy right here, he is um, – Read a lot. It turns out he lost two family members within three days. I think he lost his grandma and his cousin within like three days. Uh, but this allows us to have that conversation with them. If we see this trend, we'll have a conversation. See if we can see number one, is the kid okay um, in this situation? You know, he's probably not. Um, and number two, if there's anything we can help him with, if it's a sleep issue or something. So we are looking at the individual uh, and tracking semester as well just to see if we can see trends and spark conversations with our athletes just another great tool again to engage with athletes right so just when i'm finding this myself that we can put together great workouts uh, we can lead a good class or group or whatever um, that we feel but there's i, I first heard it from Ron McKeefery. There's still 22 hours, 23 hours out of the day that we do not control, right? And this is the, the piece that kids need to learn because this is going to set them apart. This is the game change. This is how you become elite. And I'm, I'm sold on the fact that if we can encourage kids in the right way and get them going in the right way, that they are going to see that benefit, you know, not only in the weight room, but in their athletic performance. And that's, that's what we're shooting for here. So, you know, and then later on, lifetime wellness with it. So do you find that athletes like seeing this stuff and knowing where they're at and understanding if they're not hitting what they should be hitting? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, our athletes at Jewel are – we're a very high academic school. So um, in nature, our athletes are pretty self-reflective um, and like to think about where they stand and how – and get better for the most part um and they, they'd like to know that we do care that we're doing they're not having them fill these wellness surveys out just to give them one more thing to do but that we do care that we are looking for it and we tell them too with survey, like hey if you slept two hours put down two hours don't lie to us and say you had eight put down two it's not you're not going to get in trouble for it you were this is only going to help you help us help you um, and they appreciate that. And they, they do like when we have those conversations with them and it kind of, sometimes it catches them off guard. Like, Oh, you guys are actually looking at that. Um, but it is a really good tool for us. And one thing I would say with this too, is I was, I was going through this. <clears throat> seems like it's a lot of steps. I mean, it's a daily routine for me. I'll run, I'll come in the morning, I'll run the report and then I'll run those reports into the Excel uh, spreadsheet I have. It takes maybe 10 minutes to do, um, I usually do probably about five or six teams, 100 to 200 athletes a day. It does not take that long. Um, so if you're watching, like, ah, it's a lot of steps, I don't have time for that. Yeah, you probably do. Uh, if you, if you want to, if you can just get in a system down um, to do it. If, so if anybody wants help with that, surely, um, for sure, reach out. So moving on, um, commitment assessment. So much like Silbernagel, you know, if it's important, you should track it. We all talk about commitment on how that's important. So are your athletes committed or are they compliant? Um, and Matt Nine here is amazing. Um, Salisbury University, he was, a, again, a number 18 episode really early on. He just has a, a great way of just developing culture um, and assessing – commitment and many other things within the team and just an amazing conversation we have with him 
Um, and he also was one of the first ones to kind of introduce me to the Focus 3 guys and the E plus R equals O con concept. I think Preston, you were one of the guys to introduce me to that as well that we use with the athletes. But what, what we've taken from Matt um, is this Cardinal Edge program, which is we're using to help our athletes, number one, understand and be aware of what true commitment is. We assess that, uh, reflect on it, and see if we can um, ad what areas we need to adjust to co continue being the best version of ourselves. So with the Cardinal Edge, um, first off, it's important to define what is commitment. So that's the first part of Cardinal Edge here. And, and I apologize, this is, a, if you're watching, kind of came out kind of blurry. So um, if you want these, reach out, I'll send them to you. Um, compliance is not commitment. And that's something that our, a lot of our athletes think that if they just do what they're supposed to do, good enough, check that box, move on with their day. But we talk about um, if you want to be the best version of yourself as an athlete, there's these five areas, so strength, condition, nutrition, rest and recovery, playing the sport, and we added mental skills in there. So the whole Cardinal Edge program in general is to help our athletes understand this relentless pursuit of the best version of myself, which ties into the mission of our department is to help their, our athletes pursue the best version of themselves. So this is one way we're doing it. So the first step of this is just getting our athletes aware of these five areas. I think they all understand strength conditioning is important, probably, hopefully. They all understand that obviously playing this sport's important. Our basketball team's shooting baskets 24 seven, but nutrition's neglected a lot. Rest and recovery is certainly neglected a lot, especially in our college setting. And then the mental skills kind of hard one to define uh, within our setting, but it's obviously extremely important as well. So we define these areas, give them some stuff to think about within those areas um, is the first step of this Cardinal Edge program. And the last thing at this, I think, is we talk about the grind and you know, our athletes grind. They see it on Twitter all the time. They're grinding with their weights and running and, and you know, shooting baskets or whatever, playing this. But are they grinding like they say they are and how they eat on how they sleep habits on, on these mental skills, how they deal with diversity and their emotions? Uh, I doubt it. Um, and those are probably the more separating factors between other sports because everybody's probably grinding uh, from if you want to use that word in the, in the weight room and on the field. everybody's doing that I mean I don't, I don't want to get down that road uh, <laughs> uh, so from this awareness uh, cardinal edge is first step next ones is the assessment side so to preface this it is not a perfect system it's all they fill this out themselves it's a self-assessment um, but it is good for them to go through this process. So we have this commitment continuum um, along that scale, resistant, reluctant, compliant, committed, compelled. It's kind of the process there. We have examples of what behavior of that looks like for each number. Um, so our athletes will grade themselves in each of five areas based off this scale. Um, and it allows us to see, you know, where can we get better? Where are our gaps? Cardinal Edge Assessment Report. Um, we run a report just like we would the wellness survey. It's the same report. Uh, um, reds aren't great. Yellows are okay. Greens are good. Gives them a total number. Um, really easy, simple report we'll run. And then just like our wellness survey, we'll track that. So this example, our volleyball team over a four-week span. <clears throat> this year's scores out of 50. I usually double that score down here at the bottom. You know, that's a grade out of 100. So if you're Thinking about that as a grade in the classroom, that's a C, C minus to a C average commitment we have here. Then we have um, our team averages as well, you know, our average strength conditioning commitment, nutrition, rest, sport, mental skills. Um, we redded athletes if they are below 35. Uh, so that would be a, a D grade. So in the 60s, um, if you double that, they didn't fill it out. So what we want with this, again, it's not a perfect system. It's all self-assessment. So they could go through there and put tens on everything if they wanted to. We obviously encourage them not to. We explain to them the importance of this and why we're doing it for them to self-reflect and really find gaps in their commitment that they can – You may, if you're a 10 out of 10 on strength conditioning but you're a four on nutrition, maybe you don't need to do an extra workout. 
maybe we need to spend some time and figure out what we're doing in the cafeteria. Uh, that's kind of the purpose of it. So again, looking for trends um, as a team trend, it got better every week. That's what we want. Um, obviously individual we're getting better every week, but you know, what's the most importantly, obviously is that their behavior reflects a better commitment, not just their uh, self-reported commitment. So, um, we used to do this from a frequency standpoint every week. Uh, I found that to be just a little, bit, a little bit too much. So I dialed back a little bit. And what we did this semester is we did it at the start of every cycle and had them reflect back on the previous three weeks. So when they got back in January, we ran the assessment and I had them reflect on commitment to being the best version of themselves over winter break. So it's about a seven week period there, okay? And then we, we filled it out again. After about three or four weeks of training, we started a new cycle. They filled that out again. So, um, and then we got cut off. Actually, I, I think we got one more in. We got one more cycle in. So we, we ran it three times here this this year. But I think that works a little bit better. It gives them a little bit more of a, a little bit more data to reflect on too, if you give them a good three or four week period. So um, that's what we're doing with that. And that's, our athletes love that too. Got really good feedback on that. Again, our athletes are, pretty bright. Uh, they love to go through that kind of self-reflection phase. Um, and our, our college itself is really strongly encourages that. So it's, it's right on in line with our, our college mission as well. Gage, um, right now you talked about a culture assessment, which was discipline, being responsible, being a teammate. Um, then you talked about athlete monitoring and kind of your wellness scores and, and how that played into stuff. And now this is commitment tracking. You're tracking a lot of different things that are not their 40 time, their squat. Not that you don't do those, but this is this is the stuff I think that separates it, right? You one of your quotes on there was uh, it's just a ticket to the game or a ticket to attend, right? You still there's still so much more to actually winning. And I think this is a lot of that stuff. My biggest hang up is how are you getting all these conversations in to discuss this? Are you doing like a a meeting like preseason, postseason, that type of stuff, or is this within passing within the weight room? How do you have your conversations? Um, I would say a little bit of both. Um, probably more in passing. Um, so, like, what I'll do is I'll run this report and I'll give it to our coaches so they can see it too. Um, and then from there, it's it's more of a in passing probably. And again, we look for outliers. Uh, trends. So if you see an athlete that's, you know, a 20 out of 50 committed, well, we need to go have a conversation with that and not make them, you know, get mad at them or anything for it, but just understand why his commitment is what it is. Um, but for example, in, we ran a report and we saw that our team's about a five out of 10 committed to nutrition. So that sparked me as we had nutrition talks then, um, talks we've done a million times, but revamped that again and said, listen, our team average on a Cardinal Edge report is a 5.72 out of 10 from a nutrition standpoint. Let's have a conversation on, on why that is. And I, in that situation too, I usually take ownership and I say, listen, part of that, I'm going to take some blame for that and say, I haven't educated you well enough. Well, that's changing right now. We're going to talk about some stuff. Um, but at the same time, put it on them as well. It ultimately comes down to them making those decisions, but certainly not, putting all the blame on them and taking ownership myself and making sure that I am doing my part and educating them like we should. So I guess like it is hard. I mean, we can't have all these conversations with every single athlete, but again, it's more about looking for trends and finding areas that we can get better at. And then from there, um, finding ways on how we can do that within our constraints. I really, I really think this is good. And I think maybe the, the other awesome part of this is giving it to sport coaches. It's like, yes, sport coaches want to see how much they can clean, squat, bench, that type of stuff. But, you know, like they want to see who's committed, who's not, right? They, they know if their athlete can play or not. The, the question would be, can, can they be a great teammate? Can they be a leader? Can they be an impact player for us? And I think this would be part of that. So that's good stuff. And they certainly help you with, um, analyzing yourself so if you go back to this I mean the sport coaches are going to know what their commitment is to playing the sport they're probably going to have a pretty good idea of what their um, 
ability to handle adversity and complain and all of this, the mental skill side, that maybe I don't get to see as much. Um, I'm not out at every one of their practices. I'm not um, at every game, unfortunately. So um, the sport coaches can see those too and say, okay, she or he said she's an eight out of 10 on playing the sport, working on those like, skills, but she's never getting any extra work in. Or maybe she rated herself out of five out of 10 on that, but she's the hardest working girl on the team. So it's, it's important to know your athlete as well, because some athletes we see will actually undervalue uh, their commitment too. That's part of it. Um, but honestly, I think probably 90% of them, the way they rate themselves it is probably how I would rate themselves too, from what I can see from them. So, um, and like you said too, we do track a lot of stuff outside of just performance itself. Um, I don't know. I, I just, I think this is more important personally, uh, just to be pretty upfront about it. And it might not be a popular thing about to hear from strength coaches, but I mean, I, I run all the testing numbers and stuff too, and it's good. And it's important. Obviously you need to get better at it. Uh, but this stuff I think is the more separating factor for sure. And areas that we can get, make bigger gains, um, compared to, increasing your squat by 30 pounds is guess what everybody else in our conference increased their squat by 30 pounds too. That's just the reality of it. Um, in my opinion. So, um, real quick, I guess, on Matt nine's topic as well too. I won't go through all this. <clears throat> is this E plus R equals O? This is from focus three. Uh, check those guys out. Just an amazing resource. Um, Tim and Brian Kite, which they've actually kind of split now into two different, but their model of E plus R equals O is based just how to handle adversity, um, how to control the controllables, all those things. They talk about discipline, um, just stuff that I think our athletes at Jewel, and I, if I had to guess, all athletes probably struggle with. Um, if you, these are notes that I've taken from them. If, if you, want it, I'll send it to you as well, but I would encourage you to go listen to their resources on YouTube, Focus 3 Podcast, just amazing. Um, but again, Matt and I is kind of the first one that kind of put me onto this. Um, this is more of the Focus 3 stuff. We talk about this concept of the edge, which ties into our Cardinal Edge program, which what the edge is, is that breaking point between average and elite. Um, is that that edge right there and elite behavior is where the best version of yourself lives, which ties into our vision or mission statement as a department. Um, that's why we called it the Cardinal edge, um, discipline over default. Another sheet we use with our athletes, talk to them about, uh, I'm not going to read through those, but again, if you want any of these, please just, um, uh, let me know. Uh, I'll send them to you, but those are some of the other, from a culture behavior standpoint, we're talking about with our athletes the best that we can. Those are all great resources. Okay, so the next one here, um, Eric Hoyam, uh, Central Washington University. This is a very simple, that within our study, we were, we were it, when he said this, like, oh man, it's so easy and obvious. I can't believe I didn't think of it myself. Um, we're able to do it within our schedule, but he uh, schedules recovery sessions like, you know, big time schools do where they're making recovery important or a priority. We all talk about it. So what we're doing right now is we have a scheduled uh, recovery concessions. Uh, Coach Alex Phillips, she's a, a part-time employee through the Liberty Sports Medicine uh, Hospital. We have a, a partnership with them, but she comes over uh, two hours a day. And at two o'clock, Monday through Thursday, she um, hosts a, 20 to 30 minute recovery session. So it's working on soft tissue stuff, um, you know, stretching, mobility work, ankle, knee, hip, or ankle, hip, T-spine, glute work, and then all kinds of stuff, like yoga concepts. Um, that's just open to anybody. It's not mandatory for sure. Um, if you can, if it's in your schedule, come do it. And then we have a lot of athletes like, well, I can't make it because of class, which is, we, we understand that. Um, so what we do with that is, you know, we maybe give them the recovery session and, and they could do it in their dorm room at home too. And they, they you can't um, try to tell our athletes, you don't have to wait for us to tell you to do it. So, um, you know, we do off season competitions too. So to encourage attendance, we, we give athletes points, um, 
for attending, which is kind of fun. Um, here's an example of one session she was leading. Um, pretty good turnout. We usually have anywhere from probably, sometimes there's only two, like Monday's a big class day, mainly get two. And then our Tuesday, this Incus was a Tuesday, I think there's 13 or 14 there. So um, again, just to bring in that option um, is a great resource that we've been able to do from a, a schedule and staff standpoint. So um, pretty easy one there. Moving on from that, we have uh, Kurt Hester. I think most people uh, know Kurt. Uh, some of the stuff I'm going to talk about today is not necessarily stuff he talked about in the podcast itself, but um, that and his book I've implemented at Jewel. Uh, so with that, get his book, Rants of a Strength Conditioning Madman's fantastic. It's an easy, fun read, and just a lot of practical stuff out of as well. Um, something I took out of this is just staff evaluation and, and just administrative documentation that I didn't have or know how to do. Uh, especially again, I was a 24 year old strength coach in charge of a department. I, I didn't, no one ever taught me this. I didn't know how to do this. So, um, I developed a kind of a formal process that had to handle some of these things, uh, specifically like incident forms, confident documentations, um, to make sure we're doing that stuff from uh, to run a professional uh, department. So this is pretty much straight out of his book. Um, I changed it a little bit for our, our setting, but this is our evaluation sheet. You know, we did evaluations obviously before that with my staff, um, but I like this one much better. It's very simple. It's a one to three scale on all these qualities. I also give this area to, to write in some stuff. Um, and we do this quarterly. So at the end of every uh, you know, semester or, or season, we'll do this. Um, and we'll check up, check up with my staff in the middle as well, obviously, but not maybe as formal as this. So we're, we're using that from Coach Hester. And then these two forms, um, altercation form, injury incident form. Uh, this altercation form, I, I believe he talks about using this in, in situations where, um, you know, maybe you're – uh, a sport coach, a difficult sport coach is wanting you to run a certain protocol um, that you don't agree with. Um, maybe he wants you to go run 10 300 yard shuttles and you say no, but he's insistent on it. Um, and God forbid, and hopefully never happens, but something happens and um, kid gets hurt, whatever. He would encourage you, uh, you know, to document that altercation or disagreement or whatever it is. So you have a pre-documented um, form that shows I was not um, in, I was not encouraging this or on board with following this protocol uh, is one example you might be able to use it. Also, if you just have an altercation with a staff member, a student athlete, uh, we tell our staff, if you ever get, um, for some reason, we probably encourage you not to, but if an athlete starts cussing you out, and you cuss them out on it's just a yelling back and forth well we need to document that um so a couple examples you might use that document luckily we have not had to use that document yet but we do have it um in case we do this injury incident form obviously we're not trying to uh hurt anybody in our weight room but it does happen um i'll, I'll admit that I'm, I'm assuming i'm not the only person that's had an athlete get hurt in the weight room um but like example, just stuff that happened. We had a uh, an athlete fall to glue ham and she like got dizzy, passed out, fell off the glue ham and cut her forehead open, was bleeding everywhere. So that's an example where you might use this document just to record that. Um, you know, you go through athlete signs it, I sign it, our director of sports med signs it just to have that on file. So nothing groundbreaking there, uh, but I think those are good to have. And I think most strength coaches I shouldn't say most, but I think probably a good number of strength coaches don't have those processes to go by. Maybe I'm the only idiot that didn't. So <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say that. Um, okay. Now getting to more of some training stuff. I just got a few more here. Um, obviously, you know, agility, change direction training uh, is important. We all do it. Um, Corey Van Wyk is brilliant on this. He's kind of on – you know, kind of the ground floor of is talking about this of defining what agility is um, and kind of trying to reframe people ideas on how to use that. 
Um, I used to do just, you know, change of direction progressions um, before I got into anything reactive as a progression. What I still use some of those change of direction type mechanic work, but we just make it reactive in nature pretty immediately, right out of the gate. Um, the whole idea of this is to help with that, you know, that decision loop. It's called the OODA loop. Uh, I won't get into it, but you guys can research it. Um, so we do these matchup games. I'll show you some multiplayer games. It's actually from uh, Nick DeMarco in the book, The Process. Um, some examples that we'll do with that. And then uh, I did want to share a quote I had about our, our softball coach. Uh, he told me before winter said, uh, so direct quote. So I don't know what you're doing with the reactive stuff, but it's made a huge difference with our team. Uh, so that was kind of fun for me to uh, hear that or good to hear because uh, just to see that the sport coaches are seeing some uh, good results from him as well. He said like just our first step quickness and our ability to get to a ball in the hole or whatever it is has been just so much noticeably different since started doing this uh, stuff, which I think was a cool, um, just reassurance and, and um, cool thing for him to say and notice. So this is, um, again, this is Corey's stuff and, and some of the other people that um, document these things, but these are some of the drills that we've used. Mere chase and scores. Uh, these are all in a box setting. You can do a line setting. They're all in a, like a 10 by 10 box. You can't really... There's a line here, 10, 10, goal line up. Okay, so we're side lining up, 10 by 10 box. This is Mir, uh, the defensive guy, is just trying to stay as close as possible to the offensive guy uh, without touching them. So this is too far. I'm trying to get him. We tell him, you know, a, a foot from him. So if you had to touch him, you could. Um, close space, create space. Chase. Um, is like a tag game uh, or chase down an opponent, cat and mouse. Example of this, this is actually a hybrid uh, that we did this day. I wouldn't include This is box mirror chase. So right on the go, uh, it's mirror. It's the same drill. That's the defensive guy. This is the offensive guy. They all have to stay up in the box. I'll let him do that for about five seconds. Then I say chase. And they have, it's a chase, three, two, one, countdown. This guy has three seconds to tag him uh, to win the drill. So, sorry for the language there. Uh, there's Mir. There's the go. He's trying to tag. Simple drill. Um, and this is score. So, this is just simply – and these two drills, they're just trying to stay within the box. This drill, offense, you can't see the defensive guy. He's on the sideline. He's just trying to score across the end line. Uh, the defensive guy is trying to – um, defend his goal line. I'm not going to change like teach here, but it's kind of a fun video. So those are three drills we're using with that. We do quite a bit of that. Our guys like it. Um, it I, it's much better than just doing a box drill, personally. Um, so then the I, next – sorry, Preston, go ahead. Uh if I remember back, I remember listening to Nick DeMarco on Simply Faster's podcast. Um, and they were talking about uh, one more category. Do you remember what that category is? So, Mirror yeah. Chase scored. Yeah, uh, Dodge. Um, dodge. I haven't used much Dodge. Um, again, I'd encourage you guys to reach out to them if you want uh, stuff from the experts on them, we have, especially with the Dodge stuff. I haven't done much with that. Uh, but, yeah, that is the fourth one. And then with this – Agility, uh, we also do um, we call game-based – I forgot to put a video on here. I forgot. Um, game-based conditioning, basically, uh, multiplayer games. So those are more matchup games that I just showed you. But playing these multiplayer games, especially like in the early off-season, I think has been great for uh, conditioning itself. We did it with our volleyball girls. Um, and uh, the – Simple progression we use with that is the first one is called keep the ball. And basically you're just trying to – it's keep away is all it is. You get points for so many uh, passes you get with your team, points for interceptions or deflections or whatever. And you just play for like however long you want, four or five minutes, whatever it is. And then you can advance that to more like an ultimate Frisbee type concept. Um, and that smokes them more than anything, especially like in early off scenes, it's just kind of a general conditioning format. That burns them up. 
about as much as a uh, pushing sleds or whatever else that stinking burns them up and they have fun with it. God forbid that athletes have fun. Um, so I've really enjoyed that. I'd encourage ath- or everybody here. If you're interested in that, Kurt Hester has got an example of a game he uses um, in his book. Uh, I think Cal Deeds has one online somewhere. Um, but a really good resource is the book, The Process um, by Fergus Conley and uh, Cameron Joss. I think that's how you say his name. But Nick DeMarco is kind of quoted in there on, on how he structures it. And they have some really good recommendations on how to progress those games. Um, it, 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 is a smart way to go about it. I wouldn't just throw, uh, throw them out on a football field and say, go, um, just to minimize risk of injury and progression with that as well. So uh, really fun stuff with that we've been using instead of maybe some, tra- some of the traditional conditioning methods, especially early off season. So, okay, uh, moving on from that, it's kind of the last um, one we're currently using or, or diving into, uh, Trevor Florendo at Colorado School Mines. This is actually one of our more recent episodes and one of my favorites. Um, he did a fantastic job, brilliant, brilliant guy. Um, and he, he's talked about how he's usually maybe using a velocity based training um, and some other sports science measures just to kind of, they have a sports science department. So he's doing a lot of research, but uh, he, he's using push bands for velocity based training. Um, and something he talks about in there is, is, you know, you can, a lot of back, uh, coaches will argue back and forth on, you know, the, the velocity zones and all, and all that. But more than anything, if, if anything, this velocity-based training creates maximum intent. If you're trying to do speed work, those things will get your athletes to move that bar as fast as they possibly can. It's a game to them at that point. He talked about how their training this year on some days is the overall volume is down up to 60% on some training days. So they talk about how every rep is important and their just numbers are out the roof. Um, So listen to the episode. I mean, he kind of talks about how they break down their week, but this is uh, something we're trying to implement here. So a couple examples Um, over here is our iPad. We have our our push band. This is an example of how we're using it. Um, Kind of with this right now, with both of these things on this slide, is we're not making any huge, um, I guess, changes in our programming right now. We're more in just in the field out data collection phase. Uh, so there's velocity-based training. We're dealing with just a select number of our athletes. And we're also looking at reactive strength index, uh, which we're recording with a just jump map, which I think probably a lot of you can afford if you don't have one. Um, you know, a lot of the research is collected by uh, force plates, but you can record on a just jump map. And, we had just done this for about two or three weeks before Corona hit. So again, we haven't done a whole lot of, we haven't changed any of our programming off of it. We're just looking at data here. Um, so I'll restart this and let this play start. GA Joe Brown demo for us. So you can see up quick jump sticks. Um, and this gives you a contact time and a vert height time. So, this is the formula that we're using height and meter or curve. We, well, uh, convert that inches to meters divided by the ground ground contact time in seconds. We'll just spit out this RSI number over here, which if you don't know what good RSIs are, which I'm still trying to figure out, do not judge my numbers because those are not very good. Uh, but again, we're just kind of starting to play around with this. Um, here's kind of a formula some people use, but again, we haven't changed, but something you could do that we've looked into that some coaches are doing. So if, if an athlete has a good ground contact time, which like this one might hear, like 0.28 is pretty good. They say anything like maybe below 0.325 is a good ground contact time. But their vert's not great. They probably need more strength work. It means they're pretty elastic off the ground, but they need more strength to be able to produce force um, through the floor. So that might be an example of that. Or maybe a poor ground contact time, good vert, they need more plyo work. Um, I mean, their verts are all pretty bad on this, honestly. I don't necessarily have a good example for that. If they're poor on both, they probably need more both. And that, I think, would probably um, would uh, categorize our volleyball team pretty well for the most part. But uh, just example of maybe ways you can use um, 
some pretty cheap resources. Honestly, these are about 350. This is about the whole unit's probably, I don't know, six, seven hundred, eight bucks. I don't know, something like that, that you can, you can collect some of this data without maybe a force plate. So, or a Tendo unit or gymware or whatever it is. Gage, when I'm, when I'm implementing this stuff, um, is that a 12 inch box? So that's an 18 inch that we did. 18. Um, and then that just has to stay the same or is that the standard across? Like if we're doing RSI and you're going to be able to compare to other athletes or other strength coaches, is it always 18? So again, we're just playing around with it, but we did them all in 18. But this is another way you can use this looking at research is people will use these RSI's numbers and jump athletes from multiple heights and see what the ultimate, the best drop jump height is for that athlete based off their abilities. So what the research says, like you start them at a 12 and they jump, record it. And at an 18, if they can hit a very similar RSI at 18, then they can use the 18 inch box. You bump them up to a, maybe a 21, their RSI drops down dramatically, well, they 18. Or if you had them at 12 and they went to 18, they got slower, um, their RSI was worse, they needed to drop at a 12 at that point. So this is a way that you can, does that make sense? Um, yeah, it does. Yep. That is a way that you could um, try to uh, get the best drop jump height for each athlete. We did them all at 18, uh, just because that's going to get time consuming, you know, so we're still trying to find out best ways to implement it. But uh, for the three weeks we did it, we did them all on 18s. I like that. And maybe my last question for this, this slide is, um, where would be the best information for RSI? Like if we wanted to read about it. Um, push band, uh, trainwithpush.com. They've got like three or four, they got kind of an information research uh, series on RSI, that is very good. Um, can't remember the author's name, um, but they're, the author of that also did a lot of research that you can get, I think, in the journal strength conditioning as well um, on RSI itself. Um, so I would, I would look at trainwithpush.com. Um, they got some really good stuff. And then there's a really good article about velocity-based training. Um, I think it's on Stack. They talk about uh, is your athletes uh, a kangaroo or a gorilla, and it's it's a it's this kind of similar concept. Um, these athletes are very strong that we chose we chose to do this with, um, so we're trying to give them some more velocity uh, based off these uh, speeds. It's kind of what we're doing with that too. But um, I would look up that article as well if you want me to send them to you maybe reach out and I can, I can find them and send them to you if you can't, if you can't. I got a whole lot, a whole list of stuff that, that I'm going to have. To. <laughs> this is great. No. Sounds good. <laughs> All right. So the next thing I guess we're doing with this is just vertical tracking. Um, it's kind of down the record rank publish mindset. Uh, but basically all we're doing is recording it and we're publishing PRs uh, vocally. Uh, we don't necessarily rank them just from a, a time standpoint. We probably could. We just haven't made that a priority right now. But we try to we do pretty effectively um, record verticals for every athlete, um, and then we'll call out PRs loud for everyone. This is on a Google Sheet um, that all my staff has access to, so it's not just me recording it on my computer. So what this might look like is uh, this is the start of the semester. This was all yellow to start. This is their PR coming in in the semester, and this is week by week their vert numbers. Yellow is an all-time PR. If he hits that, we'll call out PR, John, where his name is. Um, and then after three or four weeks, we'll also green. Greens are PRs for that semester. So, you know, he hasn't jumped an all-time PR, but the best he jumped this semester is 30.9. Um, and that's five weeks. Something that to kind of look at, uh, we especially use these, um, knowing these, coming off of off periods or dead periods, we like to see where athletes fit, um, maybe an indication of their training over breaks. Um, it's been a really good process for us. Um, what we saw in the fall, I think 70% of our athletes, all of our athletes hit a PR uh, during the fall semester at some point, um, which is 
way better than we've ever done because we typically do like, you know, it's testing week and we're going to test verticals that week. Well, kind of just crossing your fingers that their nervous system's right. They've recovered and they hopefully you get a good PR jump that day. Um, so this has been a really good um, process for us. And the whole PR thing is great too. So we'll call it out and the whole team celebrates and the kids like that and motivates them. Um, you know, and, and I have on the slide here, 50% of our volleyball team PR the last week of their season last year, including um, the best vertical jump I've recorded for a female. So uh, that's been effective for us, pretty easy. It's a Google sheet and a just jump mat you can get through athletes We're kind of incorporating our warmups uh, before their uh, first or second lift of the week. So, all right. So last thing um, or last coach I want to highlight here. This is my next thing. I don't I'm not do anything with this right now. Uh, I'm trying to implement some things. Uh, it's Michael Reese at Lindenwood. He's a pretty recent one too. I think he's in the seven, yeah, 79 there. His staff development processes are amazing. He's got a, big staff there. It's kind of almost a D1 model that maybe most of us are not in. Um, but man, he's got some stuff you can take away there. So check out his episode. He's got different curriculums for full-time GAs and interns. Um, he has a mentor me mentee program and staff Skype or Zoom calls, which I'm actually implementing during this dead period. We're going to start um, my staff. We've got about five or six of us. We're going to start Zoom calling so, some coaches to keep learning. So um, check his stuff out check out their Instagram page and social media stuff as well. It's pretty good. So, um, and then the last thing I'm going to talk about today, I think I've said that four times now. The last thing I want to talk about is the Cardinal Edge podcast. So, um, I hope you can see, we've tried to tie to everything back in just to our mission, our vision It's kind of guiding everything we do. And this is the next thing. It's pretty new, about a month, maybe two months old. Uh, and our tagline for this this podcast is just for William Jewell athletes. I guess it's not. It's made for William Jewell athletes. Anybody can listen to it. It's on our YouTube. It's not on Apple Podcasts because that costs money. Um, no, but the tagline of it is pursue best you, uh, which is pursue the best version of yourself, which is the vision of our athletic department or our performance department, which ties in the Cardinal Edge assessment we do. Um, it all kind of ties in. So, what we've done with this is create this podcast, this resource uh, that we host on our YouTube page that will always be on there. Well, we can talk in depth, and it's just me right now. I'm going to try to incorporate maybe my staff in at some point. In depth on some of these the topics I've already talked about. So nutrition, culture. Um, it's tough for us to do that with scheduling your constraints because we do a shotgun approach with our teams because based off class schedules where between – you know, five and eight o'clock, we may train six teams. So I can't really spend 10 minutes to talk with volleyball at the end of their lift because softball starting, uh, which is frustrating. So basically, I got tired of using that as educator athletes. So kind of goes back to making the big time where you're at. Do the best you can with what you have where you are. So a way that we can educate our athletes in a way that's um, not time dependent, uh, with the resources and the skill that I have and knowledge I have. Um, so this is what we created. It's pretty simple. I'm actually using Zoom, um, exactly how Preston's recording this, to record uh, these podcasts that we'll host on our YouTube page where we talk refuels our nutrition model. Uh, we'll talk macro, gaining weight, losing weight, all these topics your athletes always ask you about. It's, uh, meal timing. We'll do a nutrition talk and we'll behavior or culture topic within podcast so i think i have four up right now they're all about 20 minutes long it's nothing too crazy um they're on there so anytime our athletes want to hear about carbohydrates they can pull up the carbohydrate episode um and listen to it and there's also um uh, future episodes i'm going to dive into some mindset training which is amber selking another great resource her podcast is building championship mindsets She's the sports psychologist for uh, Notre Dame football, I think, currently. Um, great, great stuff there, too. So that's another current project we're working on, pumping out a lot of those episodes over this break. Um, that's another one. Everybody could do that. That is not resource dependent at all. It's You got to have a little bit of technology savvy, which is not hard. Um, again, reach out to me if you want me to teach you or give you advice on how to do it. Uh, I'm sure Preston could help as well. 
uh, but that is one way that we're we're trying to connect our athletes in a, a way that maybe is outside the norm so those are all great um, that that last little bit where you talk about all those behavior nutrition behavior topics that you're going to go through those are all great things to be able to reference again and again for student athletes right so like you know, if you get to the point where you where you've got a decent amount of athletes listening to those and and staying on top of that stuff, maybe we can affect those other 22 or 23 hours of the day. But hopefully, at that point, they're also sharing with their teammates and they're hearing hearing you not just in the weight room but in other places in their life. And I think this would just be another awesome resource for our student athletes. So, um, I'm I'm. Uh, thinking about how I'm going to set this up for, for me too. Um, when you had me listen to your first one, I'm like, Oh man, this is good. So I started listing out all the topics I wanted to go through. And it's, it's really fun just to be like, Hey, um, another way that we can help, help people. And kind of how I envision it too, is hopefully, you know, we get more and more down the road, kind of set up on the front end, almost like in a curriculum base to where, we can try to say, you know, as best that we can, hey, this week, if you have time, by Wednesday, listen to episode number two. And then at the end of their Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday lift, we can just touch those points really quick. Episode two was about eating breakfast and um, pressing pause within our E plus R equals O formula. So then I might be able to cover, expand on that real quick or take a question on that within three or four minutes at the end of a lift instead of having to give them the entire background again, they already got that coming in. So um, that's where we want to head with it. We'll see how it goes. Uh, we've gotten good, good feedback on it so far. Athletes like it. Um, but phase right now, it's new. Just trying to push as many athletes to it as possible now. So um, that pretty much wraps my stuff up. So, uh, you know, thanks to, you know, Coach Peterson on here, obviously. Um, great friend and, and resource and uh, just all the work he's done to help me is just fantastic. Joe Q, our mentor, uh, you know, Jake Niederman, another mentor, friend of ours. Uh, my staff at William Joe College, just, they do an amazing job, make my easier. And, and um, our, I hope they feel like they are um, a big part of our department because they, they, they are our department. So uh, Team Builder Powerlift um, for sponsoring our show, Rob McKeefrey for for helping us get this thing going. And then I included Zach Mathers and NSCA on here. I had a chance to do this talk um, at the South Dakota State Clinic this year. It was my first opportunity to kind of talk in front of our peers, uh, which is a fantastic experience. Um, my contact information is on there as well. Again, if you want any of this information, uh, please reach out. My Twitter and Instagram are mostly just my son, um, which is kind of fun, in my opinion, uh, to look at. Uh, but my cell phone's on there as well. You can shoot me a text. So, uh, Preston, thank you uh, for putting all this together again. Um, and hope hope we got something good out of this. Uh, to, to all the listeners, all the people that are watching on YouTube, I will have all this stuff in the show notes. Um, I have the hyperlinks there so that you guys can reach out to Coach um, pretty easily. And I would tell you, take him up on, on these resources. Um, the E plus R equals O um, kind of breakdown sheet, the notes that he has, I stole that from him a couple of years ago now. And it is – it is something that I reference with our athletes all the time. I've given it to sport coaches. Um, they can't get enough of that stuff because it's sports psychology in a bite-sized way um, that's really easy for people to understand. And all those other resources um, are just a great opportunity. I'm actually going to see if Gage will let me steal a few of his things right now. So um, thank you for listening. Thank you for taking the time to, to clinic with us. I, I know it's a little bit different of a feel. Um, one, of the, one of the best things about a clinic is obviously getting to be around other coaches, right? So yeah, we want to get information from the presenters. Uh, we want to learn as much as we can, but to have conversation, to be in community with others um, that are on the same path that we are is such a big deal. So please, please, please reach out to me, reach out to Gage, reach out to all the other presenters that we're going to have on that will sh uh, we'll filter this through, okay? So we're, we're originally gonna have 21 presenters speaking on this, this coming up Saturday. Obviously it's not happening anymore, but we will have 21 presenters or close to it still that will, um, as, as I get these recorded, I'll push them out to you guys and um, just please use this as an awesome resource to, to get better and 
and uh, you all stay safe and during this time, um, stay healthy, and, and um, we'll, we'll keep you in our prayers, thinking think about all the student athletes, all the coaches out there that are, you know, this is a huge change for them, and, and um, hopefully just enjoy the time with your family, and, and um, we'll be thinking of you guys. So, Gage, thank you. I appreciate you. This is, uh, this is awesome to have uh, some time just to do this again. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Preston.